Today at the National Press Club, Australian Competition and Consumer Commission Chair Gina Cass Gottlieb. As the first woman to hold the position, she'll be reflecting on her first 12 months in the job and the role of competition in a transitioning economy. Gina Cass Gottlieb with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia here in Canberra for today's Westpac address. My name is Andrew Tillett. I'm the political correspondent for the Australian Financial Review and the Vice President of the Club. Our guest today is Gina Cass Gottlieb, the Chair of the ACCC, with her address entitled The Role of the ACCC and Competition in a Transitioning Economy. Ms Cass Gottlieb was one of Australia's top legal eagles in competition law but 12 minutes ago, perhaps in a case of a poacher turned gamekeeper, she was appointed the nation's competition watchdog. Whether it is your flight turning up late, your bank short changing you on interest rates, or fretting about whether you have enough gas to heat your house, the ACCC is involved in these debates of public policy. As always, you can follow the conversation on Twitter, at Press Club Ost, or hashtag NPC. Please everyone welcome Cass Gottlieb. Gina Cass Gottlieb. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew, for your warm introduction. And also, it is great to be here in Canberra with each of you, colleagues, friends, old colleagues, and the important members of the Press Club. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to them, to their cultures, and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us in this broadcast and in this room. It has, as Andrew said, been a little over 12 months since I started my role as chair of the ACCC. As many of you know, I worked as a competition lawyer for many years before that. My passion for competition law flows from it being at the intersection of economics and the law. My driving interest in economics began in my late teens when I realised that in order to understand the commercial and political forces that shape our lives, I needed to understand economics. Coupled with my love of a good argument, a deep love, I combined economics with the study of law. In my past role and in this one, I have enjoyed the challenge of disentangling complex issues through the framework of our Competition and Consumer Act. That might sound odd, but I really mean it. A landmark piece of legislation with the stated objective to enhance the welfare of Australians through the protection of competition and fair trading and provision for consumer protection. In doing so, I have often looked for guidance to the writings of the late Professor Maureen Brunt, who upon taking up her appointment at Monash University in 1967, was the first woman to hold the title of Professorial Chair in Economics in Australia. Professor Brunt is little known outside competition law circles, but her influence in Australia and globally is profound. She made a significant contribution to the establishment and application of competition law and economics in Australia and New Zealand through her research, academic writing, and as a foundation member of the Trade Practices Tribunal, now the Australian Competition Tribunal, and also on the High Court of New Zealand in competition cases. Professor Brunt was ahead of her time in considering how competition law intersected with economics as well as social and political objectives. She noted the need for antitrust law or competition law as we call it to be relevant and socially useful and in her words to keep our eyes on the ultimate objective namely the protection of the consumer by means of efficient competitive process. This is at the centre of my approach as chair of the ACCC always keep our eyes on the consumer and the consumer interest and that informed, confident and protected consumers benefit and are benefited by vigorous and effective competition. 
COVID-19 disrupted production, as everyone in this room knows, and distribution in many critical industries globally and domestically. We're still emerging from those challenges, many of which remain unresolved into an inflationary environment, which the IMF and the Treasurer has spoken about this morning, continues to test us and is unlikely to moderate quickly. <clears throat> and we are at the same time seeking to embark on an ambitious and necessary shift to a more sustainable and technologically advanced economy. The process of competition is more important than it has ever been before. This transition will affect all of Australia's critical industries. It will affect Australian consumers and small businesses. New markets will emerge, new participants will emerge in ways we can't anticipate today. Competition is and can be a strong and driving force for the investment and innovation required to undertake this transition. An example that the critical role that competition policy reform can play and has played in Australian economic transition is the 1995 national competition policy reforms that responded to the recommendations of the 1993 Hilma report. These reforms applied nationally consistent competition conduct rules to all market participants, regardless of ownership, public or private, or legal structure, established the national access regime, bound Commonwealth and state governments to the provisions of the Act if they were carrying on a business and introduced the welfare object clause into the Act that I referred to just before. The legislative reforms together with the associated state and territory agreements were heralded as the most important single development in microeconomic reform in that decade. Now we are in another period of significant economic transition. It is a good time then, and today is a good moment to kick this off, to consider whether the critical piece of legislation, our Competition and Consumer Act, remains fit for purpose. And so I turn to our merger laws. My predecessor, Rod Sims, outlined proposed changes to Australian merger laws. After 12 months in this role, I have observed firsthand the challenges with our current settings and formed the view that changes are needed. The concerns that Rod identified in 2021 about the need for merger reform and the broad direction of the reform proposals I will now put forward remain the same. However, informed by stakeholder feedback and our recent experiences with a series of important formal merger authorisations, we have adjusted some of the elements, as I will shortly outline. The vast majority of merger transactions do not harm competition and can provide benefits, including by allowing firms to achieve efficiencies, diversify risk, or enter new markets. But we need to acknowledge that mergers can affect the competition conditions of an industry. We should also acknowledge that mergers can entail a material change in the structure of a market. The ACCC needs to have the tools necessary to be able to properly scrutinise and, if necessary, prevent those mergers that are likely to substantially lessen competition. Without these tools, some markets are particularly vulnerable to being adversely affected by further consolidation. In particular, markets that already have large incumbents with positions of market power and markets where it is difficult for new rivals to enter. <clears throat> As we know, concentrated markets are generally not good for consumers or indeed for economic growth and productivity. Companies operating in concentrated markets tend to charge higher price markups over costs for their goods and services and often have less incentive to innovate in ways that benefit consumers. In short, to paraphrase a Professor Brunt quote, these players can give less and charge more, but retain their grip on the market. The problem of concentration is a growing one in Australia. A 2021 Treasury working paper by Jonathan Hamber suggests that higher markups in the Australian economy or more like, are more likely to be caused by a decline in competition than the increased stature and benefits of more productive firms. As I stand here today, the ACCC is very conscious 
that many Australians are counting every dollar. I am concerned that consumers and the Australian economy are particularly exposed in this current environment of uncertainty and vulnerability from supply chain pressures, geopolitical issues and the climate change transition. In addition, technological advances are driving rapid structural changes to markets. Each of us is aware in the services that we acquire in our everyday actions that a handful of large tech companies are playing increasingly important roles in our lives as gatekeepers over how we interact with each other, with the businesses we deal with, and yet in many cases, these companies face only limited competitive constraint. Part of responding to these challenges is to encourage competitive, innovative and dynamic markets. Unfortunately, Australia's current merger regime is not well placed to deal with these issues. There is no requirement for merger parties to notify the ACCC of proposed mergers and acquisitions, nor to wait for clearance before they can complete. In instances where the ACCC considers a merger to be anti-competitive, and where the merger parties do not voluntarily abandon the transaction or offer remedies that address the competition concerns, the ACCC must take action in the federal court to seek orders to prevent or unwind the transaction. For these reasons, Australia's current merger control model is best described as voluntary and enforcement based. While there has been a recent rise in applications for merger authorisation, which is still a voluntary but also formal administrative process, the informal regime continues to be the main avenue used by businesses. The informal regime has developed over time without any supporting legislative process framework to enable businesses to seek the ACCC's view on whether their transaction is likely to be opposed. But we are increasingly finding that businesses are pushing the boundaries of the informal regime. Given that there are no upfront information requirements for an informal review, merger parties are increasingly giving us late, incomplete, or in some cases incorrect information. An increasing number are threatening to complete their transaction before we have finalised our review. This leads to the situation where we find ourselves negotiating with merger parties to obtain sufficient information and time to conduct our review. Or we face the challenge of unscrambling the proverbial omelette. In global transactions, we find that merger filings in other regimes that require mandatory clearances are prioritised over our voluntary informal regime. This has hamstrung the ACCC's ability to assess mergers and prevent potentially anti-competitive mergers. The process is one issue, the other is the merger law. The merger law is forward-looking. In the enforcement model to prove a breach in court, we must establish in court that the merger is likely to have the effect of substantially lessening competition in the future, in breach of Section 50 of the Competition and Consumer Act. The future is inherently uncertain, and is particularly so where markets are dynamic and there are complex commercial considerations. This uncertainty can be the driving factor behind the difficulties of positively proving a breach of Section 50. A result of these challenges is that where there is uncertainty, the default position becomes to permit or not to oppose the merger. Overall, the enforcement model means that the balance, in our view, is shifted too much toward avoiding the risk of opposing a benign merger at the expense of increasing the risk of enabling anti-competitive mergers. Where there are risks that a merger will result in significantly less competition, it is the public rather than the merger parties that ends up bearing the risk. Merger control is an important lever used by competition authorities across the world to help preserve a competitive economy. Changes to Australian current regime are needed. It is no longer fit for purpose. Australia's merger regime needs to move away from a voluntary enforcement model to a formal clearance model where merger parties must demonstrate to the satisfaction of the ACCC or a judicial decision maker that their transaction is not likely to substantially lessen competition before they can proceed. 
we propose adopting measures common in overseas merger regimes. These include a mandatory requirement for the ACCC to be notified of mergers above specified thresholds, a requirement for transactions to be suspended from completion without ACCC clearance, and upfront information requirements. This would bring Australia into line with most other OECD jurisdictions. Determining the thresholds will require careful consideration, but as with international merger regimes, this could, these could be based on the size of the proposed transaction, the size of the business being acquired globally and or within Australia, or a combination of these factors. For situations where a transaction does not meet the notification threshold, but nonetheless raises competition concerns, the ACCC should be able to call in the transaction and assess it in the formal system, which is also common in many overseas jurisdictional processes. Merger parties proposing a non-contentious transaction could apply for a notification waiver that if granted would mean the parties would not have to make a full formal application and the merger could be dealt with expeditiously. The overwhelming majority of proposed transactions would be dealt with in this way, just like our current pre-assessment triage process in the informal regime. In the proposed new formal process, the ACCC or Australian Competition Tribunal on review would not clear a merger unless it is satisfied that the transaction is not likely to substantially lessen competition. This is important because it recalibrates the decision on whether a merger proceeds where there is a risk of competitive harm. It means the ACCC or Australian Competition Tribunal must be positively satisfied there is no likely substantial lessening of competition, which is consistent with the current merger authorisation test. The ACCC's initial proposals in 2021 did not include an option for mergers to be considered under a public benefit test. We have heard feedback on the value of retaining this option because it provides flexibility where a merger may have the effect of substantially lessening competition but would nonetheless provide real, verifiable and significant public benefits. We therefore consider that merger parties should have the option of subsequently being able to apply for clearance on public benefit grounds if the applicants are not able to first satisfy the ACCC or tribunal that a transaction can be cleared on competition grounds. As noted, we consider the Australian Competition Tribunal is the appropriate review body for ACCC decisions in the formal regime. The federal court too would continue to consider applications for declaration and judicial review. I will now shift briefly to the merger law. Section 50 of the Competition and Consumer Act sets out what is often referred to as the SLC test, the prohibition of mergers that are likely to substantially lessen competition. We maintain our focus and position that there should be greater emphasis on how a merger changes the structural conditions in a market, as structural conditions are a key determinant of the level of competition. We now propose a model which would include words in the legislation to make it clear that the substantial lessening of competition test includes entrenching, materially increasing or materially extending a position of substantial market power. This would be similar to how the European Commission's merger test is framed. We consider that this change would ensure that the focus is not just on the incremental change arising from that individual merger, but also the overall enhancement of dominant positions by large firms in the market. This would also assist with addressing concerns about creeping acquisitions, the accretion of market power through a strategy of small serial acquisitions that may not amount to a substantial lessening of competition when looked at on their own. While this is an issue across the economy, this has been a particular concern in digital platform markets. Another change we support is in relation to the factors that must be taken into account in considering whether a transaction is likely to substantially lessen competition. These so-called merger factors currently include the current level of competition in a market, concentration of the relevant market, and the availability of substitutes. We believe that these should be updated 
to include references to the changes that occur overall as a result of the merger in addition to the current state of the market. I believe this package is both measured and appropriate and timely. A mandatory and suspensory regime combined with changes to the merger law will shift the balance to a merger regime that better protects competitive markets and consumers. It is our view that we can't achieve meaningful change without a policy and law shift. It will, of course, be a matter for government to consider and to progress if there are to be any reforms. Beyond the merger regime, we are all seeing real challenges and opportunities present as the global economy moves forward in the digital age. This is an area that demonstrates vividly the importance of the ACCC's complementary expertise and mandate in consumer and competition issues. While we understand the significant benefits the digital platforms provide, a range of conduct relating to digital platform services and wider digital practices by businesses outside the platform environment create widespread competition and consumer harms. Many of these harms cannot be adequately addressed by Australia's current laws. The behaviours that concern the ACCC from a competition perspective include self-preferencing, restricting interoperability with competing service providers, exclusivity agreements, practices that limit consumers' ability to switch between services or devices, or denying access to technological infrastructure. The ACCC has recommended a range of new competition measures in our recent regulatory reform report. Most notably, these include service-specific mandatory codes of conduct for designated influential digital platforms. These would allow for dynamic and flexible obligations that could be targeted and tailored to the particular competition issues relevant to each service. Consumer trust continues to be an important aspect to enhance competitive conduct and fair trading in an online environment. From a consumer perspective, addressing misconduct in relation to social media influences, harmful practices such as scams and fake reviews by businesses and individuals that are facilitated by platforms is a key priority. For victims of harmful practices, the emotional and financial cost is often exacerbated by the lack of effective avenues for dispute resolution and proper redress. We have recommended mechanisms Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 28 years old. Um, you know, I, I know the footy. I read the game very well. Um, you know. Wing to improve compliance using a range of other tools, including publishing guidelines to encourage truthful claims that we know consumers are seeking and value. 
We want to ensure that trust in business is not eroded and that consumers get the value they seek from true sustainability claims and often pay a premium for. However, sustainability issues extend beyond greenwashing. The ACCC will be closely monitoring for illegal collusion as the green transition unfolds. Collusion distorts market incentives and investment signals, which may in turn hinder the development of market-based responses and the most efficient responses to environmental challenges. Assessment of mergers in key transitioning industries will also be critical. Collusion or anti-competitive aggregations could damage the economy and diminish our much needed environmental benefits. <clears throat> Notwithstanding the potential for anti-competitive conduct, we recognise that as industries decarbonise or look to achieve environmental outcomes, there will be instances where it is more efficient and effective for companies to work together. Industry collaboration between competitors can assist in removing first mover disadvantage and free rider problems, which could lead to significant environmental and economic benefits for the Australian and global population. In Australia, we have a conduct authorisation framework already in place to deal with exemptions for proposed agreements between competitors. Our authorisation net public benefit test if businesses wish to put proposals for exemption on the basis of necessary coordination to achieve sustainability goals. The record of application, enforcement and timely reform of the competition and consumer law demonstrates real and tangible impacts in the day-to-day -day lives of Australians. In a rising cost of living environment, this practical consideration is particularly front of mind for consumers experiencing vulnerability and disadvantage. They are the Australians who most acutely feel the impacts of poor competition with less choice, higher prices, poorer services and poorer quality products. The ACCC at all times is committed to its core remit investigating and taking enforcement action to combat breaches of the law. Last year, we achieved $200 million in penalties imposed by the federal court against contraveners, which undoubtedly serves as the most effective deterrence for conduct that breaches the law and to promote the achievement of the objects of our act. In this period of significant transition across our economy, effective merger control is crucial to ensuring competition in the supply of products, services and service delivery. Stronger consumer protections online and in the general economy would support consumer trust in business required to engage with and fully benefit from new and innovative products. Reform of the competition and consumer law will make our law and regulatory enforcement powers fit for purpose in this transition period of both great opportunity and significant challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, for that speech. Um, going to the, 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 the nub of it about the changes to merger powers and laws. Um, do you have any sense of, of what mergers perhaps would have been prevented under this regime? Obviously, um, the ACCC has gone to court to, to, to try and stop mergers. Vodafone TPG is probably one of the most notable examples in recent years. Are there any that would have been prevented by this regime? And have you also spoken to the, um, the Treasurer about, about these ideas and had a re reaction from him? <laughs> Most importantly, Andrew, what we're looking for here is a better process and legal framework so that key transactions come to us first and we can satisfy ourselves and satisfy the community that we're accountable to that we're properly scrutinising. I can give you a couple of examples where the transaction didn't come to us at all. So the Meta Giphy acquisition which was opposed by the CMA and ultimately has been unwound following, following the UK CMA. However, 
there was no capacity to assess the impact in Australia of that. In um, cargo tech conocranes, which resulted in a reduction of three to two in some of the various equipment on ports, where of course we're an import dependent economy, the ACCC had not been notified by the parties. The ACCC was first told about it by customers and other market participants. Ultimately, the ACCC did review, but did not have a proper period to review. There were undertakings proposed in other jurisdictions. Those undertakings would not have been appropriate to Australian markets because we already had more concentrated markets. And that equipment is essential services and equipment for our import-based economy. So they're good examples of where a proper process, without going to court cases, a proper process will allow us to be assured that we have a sufficient time to scrutinise, to take action where there are likely serious competition harms. And also we will give more transparency both to the public, to participants interested, and also to the parties themselves about process. We have provided um, a paper to Treasury um, so that we are commencing a process, but it will be for the government to take it forward and I do not have any indication as to what the Treasurer's view is. Thank you. We'll go to our questions from the floor now and our first question is from Poppy Johnston. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks for your speech. Um, would the merger reforms you've outlined stop players like Transurban dominating the toll roads market and how would the reforms prevent this kind of market concentration? So as you're aware in the previous Transurban WestConnex uh, transaction, the ACCC required an undertaking requiring data access to enable other, given the preponderance of Transurban as the toll road provider um, in multiple jurisdictions within Australia, to give others who were tendering a greater capacity to have data in, in order to inform their competition. What this test, uh, our new proposed test would do, which would assist in matters such as that, is it will focus, in addition to the current state of competition, it will focus on change. And one of the factors that, uh, in our detailed set of factors, we wish to refer to and have greater focus on is not only the height of barriers to entry, but increases in the height of barriers to entry. And in addition, whether the transaction makes more likely that only one party or a limited set of parties will have the data that's necessary, access to sufficient data and access to key technology. So it would focus the assessment in a more appropriate way for the ACCC and also for the court or the competition tribunal. Whether it would result in different outcomes, evidence and time will tell, but it will much more appropriately set the questions and the legal framework for considering transactions that increasingly a key part of the assets that are being dealt with is a data asset, is the experience and accumulation of granular and significant scale of data. Our next question from Rachel Kwan. Rachel Klun from The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, thank you. The ACCC's airline monitoring reports are due to end in June. Mm -hmm. Noting that in the last financial year, the ACCC received more complaints about Qantas than any other company, would the Commission like to continue these reports? And are you concerned at all about the cost of flying domestically? Uh, it, so it's right, Rachel. We have one more report in relation to our airlines monitoring. Uh, we will continue to monitor airports. The, uh, and it was an inquiry put in place particularly responsive to the pandemic. Um, and uh, we have observed that industry and particularly airline competition at a very important period. It has been a period in which, as you're describing, there were significant um, service changes, capacity problems and high prices uh, coming out of the response to COVID. Uh, we had in between August and December um, uh, prices which were at decades high levels of prices. They did reduce 13% in January on average, weighted across all routes. So there was, through the return of greater capacity, 
um, uh, some mitigation, but it is an important time to watch competition in airlines. It's particularly an important time to watch competition because we have Bonza, a new entrant, that is introducing more choice on routes that have actually not been run before between regional areas, direct to holiday destinations, not through major cities. And we do, we have seen in the past problems about anti-competitive conduct. We are very concerned about slots at Sydney Airport and therefore the capacity for new competition. So we are concerned about competition and we're concerned about price. Some of the aspects relating to anti-competitive conduct sit with us perpetually and very presently in our minds. So we will watch for anti-competitive conduct carefully and we also watch for misleading and deceptive and unconscionable conduct in, in relation to consumers. But the overall reporting, unfortunately, will end. Sounds like you would like to keep it going though. We see value in it, uh, but we also recognise that um, there are many areas of investigation that need to be undertaken. Thank you. Next question from Ben Westcott. Uh, hello, Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thank you so much for your speech. Um, we're going to hear from the uh, head of Woodside here next week. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, obviously, gas companies and their supporters have been saying for some time that the imposition of price caps as well as the safeguard mechanism are making it, you know, uh, in an uncompetitive environment in Australia for new investment uh, and that those prices will be put onto consumers. What's your perspective? Is that an accurate assessment of the current situation in Australia? I don't think it's accurate. The emergency price cap does not apply to new supply and the emergency price cap, we have substantial data both covers costs and a reasonable return on costs in relation to existing supply. We are still, and we have clarified our, we've engaged with industry and clarified our guidelines in relation to compliance with the emergency price cap. In relation to the mandatory code, consultation is continuing. We are giving assistance to the relevant departments that are engaging in that, but an express policy objective that is stated in that consultation is that the reasonable pricing framework and the process under the code is to be consistent with incentives to invest in new supply. And the ACCC reports have shown the importance, even in a transitioning economy, of bringing new supply on stream in the east coast of Australia. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next question from Jess Malcolm. Hi, Jess Malcolm from the Australian newspaper. Um, I'd just like to ask what action the ACCC can provide for people who've been duped um, on the provenance of an artwork if it's not what they thought, and if you had any general reaction to reporting in the Australian which uncovered allegations of white interference in Indigenous art in recent days. The ACCC is very concerned in relation to these matters. We are engaged in uh, a cross-government work that is looking at uh, a, a number of lines of responses to this problem. So uh, one is IP Australia's work across government looking at a specific culturally tailored protection of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous cultural assets so that we can not only create, uh, prevent unauthorised um, uh, misappropriation of Indigenous cultural assets and also presentation of uh, work as if it is authentic when it is not. So we are looking for not only the current intellectual property protections, but they think there should be culturally appropriate recognising Indigenous knowledge and culture over the generations. So firstly, we support those initiatives and the Productivity Commission recommendations in relation to specific culturally appropriate protections. We do currently have powers in relation to misleading and deceptive conduct if there have been misleading representations about prominence. The ACCC has been successful in the B. Ruby Art PDY Limited uh, case in getting contraventions in terms of misleading representations where there were artefacts 
presented as uh, genuine, uh, painted by Aboriginal artists within Australia, so artefacts, um, boomerangs and didgeridoos that actually had been produced in Indonesia. Uh, we obtained uh, federal court uh, declarations that, that they were contraventions, that they were fraudulent, and also a penalty of $2.3 million, recognising not only the economic harm to Indigenous communities, but also the cultural and social harm in the misappropriation of their cultural um, representations. So we have got that power. We do strongly support additional legislative conferring of protections because we will not always be, be able to identify a breach of the Australian consumer law. So we do think there need, needs to be a very specific new set of laws to give actual property and economic rights in Indigenous cultural assets. Uh, next question from uh, Dan Jarvis Barty. Dan Jarvis Barty from the West Australian. Thanks for your speech. Another question on gas. The ACCC in the past has been opposed to the idea of a gas reservation on the East Coast. What is your current position on, on that idea and can you sort of explain the, yeah, the position? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a policy question. Um, it, it, we are also through our wholesale gas inquiry, dealing with a market that is already established and has a whole set of conditions. In the case of some of the state grants in terms of tenements, there are domestic only tenements. So there are some elements that have some part of reservation sitting in them. What we are particularly conscious and our advice to government has looked to bear in mind as the key policy objectives is that there is adequate supply for the East Coast, for businesses, residences, gas powered generation at reasonable price. And it, it, as the government stated, uh, the interventions, both emergency and then looking more into the medium term, and of course the ADGSM sitting in terms of export controls as the ultimate uh, standby overriding mechanism, do all seek to achieve adequate supply, working together with a patchwork of some elements of domestic tenements sitting on the East Coast. What is your assessment of this, hmm. the energy market generally? I mean, you talk, touch upon you know, the green transition in your speech the work you're doing on, on, on gas there. I mean, is it, it it's just such a, it's a, a patchwork of, of different sort of energy sources, regulators, responsibilities. Um, it reminds me of the old saying, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get to Dublin, you wouldn't start here. <laughs> what, what, what's, what, what's your view? I mean, should we just blow up the energy sector and start again? But we can't, Andrew. <laughs> and we shouldn't. But. Um, the... Agencies, so the regulators are working well together. And the, also we participate in energy senior officials meetings and also are privileged to participate when the ministers at a commonwealth and state and territory level come together. And that does produce working upon, uh, of course, the national electricity market has an overall East Coast in essence, but uh, so um, has an overall framework that binds e every one of the regulators together and the ACCC then contributes competition, consumer protection and um, market study inquiry uh, depth of expertise to help inform policy and reform. But it's, it's pretty dysfunctional though, isn't it? I mean... It... it in some ways, it's the nature of a federal democracy. Um, certain powers sit uh, at a state level, other powers sit at a commonwealth level, and we all must work as effectively as possible, sharing information, knowledge, concerns uh, to achieve outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, next question from Julie Hare. Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review. Thank you. 
Uh, the ACCC has announced it is looking at bank deposit rates with concerns the banks are not passing on the increases in interest rates at the same speed they are doing it to home loans. Can you say exactly what it is that you are concerned about and can you share what you have found at this stage and what is a reasonable rate that a saver should expect to be receiving now from their bank? <laughs> Julie. The, so I'll be very happy to return and give the results of the inquiry when we've concluded it. And we are about to ish, uh, publish our issues paper. Um, certainly the issues you're raising are front and centre in what we're looking at. We are looking at uh, the differences in speed of uh, increase uh, in rates, the depth of them, we are looking at the question of whether promotional rates are available only to new customers so that the vast set of loyal customers in fact almost never become aware of offers and have impediments to move so can't consumers can't take advantage of competition. Um, and we are seeking to also take account and the Treasurer's direction wants us to look at the mix of funding methods and costs so as to be able to look at whether their, the current settings are resulting in increased margins uh, for the banks and we will also look across the whole group of banks engaged in these products. It's a great example of an inquiry that is timely both as to competition and as to consumer position. It is not only members of the retiree community for whom any additional income on savings and deposits is critical at this time. Okay. Thank you. And do you have an idea of a good rate at the moment? Is it? <laughs> no. That when we gather the data, we will publish it to everyone, so everybody will see. Okay. Then cool. Our next question from Paul Carp. Paul Carp from the Guardian. Thanks very much for your speech. Uh, you mentioned illegal collusion uh, during the green transition. What sort of scenario do you have in mind there? Is it price gouging on electricity prices or something else? And secondly, uh, you mentioned wanting more powers on unfair trade practices. Uh, how might those help uh, domestic electricity consumers to uh, improve their choices? For example, should people be allowed to get out of embedded networks and that sort of thing? Hmm. Just starting with embedded networks, uh, the ACCC and the AER um, is, has recommended that the consumers on embedded networks should have the same protections and regulatory uh, structure as consumers uh, who are not on embedded networks. So to try to put protections in place given the restrictions that uh, consumers on embedded networks face. Um, in terms of uh, looking at what the question in relation to collusion, we would absolutely be concerned about agreements in relation to price or concerted practices in terms of inf sharing information on costs of transition that might lead to signalling as to common increases in price. So there, that, that is one example. But the other that uh, you can see is that is uh, collusive practices are when businesses allocate customers, allocate territories so that one will introduce new products or build um, infrastructure to one area, another to, an, to, an, to a separate area such that they keep off each other's grass and then don't compete. So we will be looking at a range of these sorts of questions. In terms of unfair trading practices, the focus that we have in this regard is that we do have un a prohibition of unfair contract terms and with the changes made by the government last year, from November this year, we will not only be able to seek, which we have successfully in the <coughs> past, be able to seek orders that declare such terms void and unenforceable, we will be able to seek action for contravention of the Act and significant penalties for such contraventions of unfair contract terms. What we do not have is a protection against processes and practices which confuse consumers, which mean that consumers, for instance, can't use contractual rights that they have because there isn't a 
customer representative available to allow a termination of a contract or a, an end of a subscription where there is a right to do so. So we're looking at practices, uh, people here will be aware of ones where you, our behavioural biases and uh, expectations are manipulated. So for instance, an answer no to giving consent on your phone device is coloured green, whereas yes is coloured red. You will be surprised how often these things occur for businesses that are prepared to manipulate consumers and use their behavioural biases. So we, we are trying to, and in many jurisdictions this is the case, we want to have a general protective unfair trading practices prohibition. We don't want to rely solely on having to show a specific breach of a particular unfair term because there is a lot of sophisticated manipulative conduct that is occurring in the digital space that looks to confuse and lead astray consumers. And we want the standards to be much higher. Thank you. Uh, next question. <clears throat> Excuse us. Next question from Melissa Code. Hello, Chair. Thank you for your talk. Melissa Code from The Mandarin. I wanted to ask a question that would prompt you to sort of explore the ideas of the challenges of being a regulator. Mm -hmm. So you started off your address talking about the intersection of law and economics. And a few weeks ago, we had uh, Claire O'Neill talk about democratic resilience and the importance of government institutions um, preserving and maintaining and strengthening that trust. What role do regulatory agencies who are often looked to as like the ones who, who have to respond when people ask, what's government doing? Um, what, how does that work its way into the way you approach regulatory reform, uh, competitive markets? You know, so much of what you discussed is interesting and relevant to policy wonks and obviously puts the consumer at the core of everything. But um, what, what do you do when you turn your mind to democratic resilience mm -hmm. as the ACCC? It's a great question. One of the core strengths we see in the Australian democracy is strong, independent and well-informed regulators sitting alongside the strength of government and policy making and sitting alongside a strong combative media and press corps because we need also as regulators to be held to account. The, so the strength of our in governance, transparency in, in our decision making, the strength of us as an institution is critical to public confidence in the enforcement of our law and also we do rely upon consumers trusting that they can come to us with complaints, that we will take action and that we are looking out for their interest. It gives confidence not only in the ACCC, it gives confidence in the law and confidence to engage with business and with the economy because they know that they are protected. So. <coughs> It's a great question because it is sitting as the fundamental underpinning of what we have to achieve as an independent regulator. In terms of the challenges of that, we want to be always focused, we want to be accessible. So we spend quite a lot of time asking is our language and communication accessible? Are we culturally and linguistically diver sufficiently diverse in our people? and in the way we engage so that we are engaging with the whole community and giving particularly people experiencing vulnerability confidence that we are looking out for them and their interests. So our challenges are we have to stay strong, have absolute integrity and be accountable. We have to be diverse and engage with community and we have to show when we attend uh, Senate estimates four times a year, multiple committees, this environment, that we are appropriately devoting the taxpayers' money to achieve those objectives. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. And our next question is uh, from Brandon Howe. 
Uh, thanks, Chair, for your speech. Uh, Brandon Howe from innovationoz.com. Um, you spoke again today about the need, need to uh, mitigate the market power of big tech service providers that act as gatekeepers between uh, businesses and consumers. Uh, just with regards to the latest um, interim report uh, that's being produced under the digital platforms inquiry, um, it, it's focusing on the expanding ecosystem of uh, digital platform providers, but uh, it, it's decided to focus specifically, or name specifically in the discussion paper, uh, cloud storage and computing services. Uh, I was just wondering if you could highlight um, why these services have been singled out and what some of the anticipated um, uh, consumer and competition harms are from concentrating power there. Thank you. So firstly, we chose for this report the ecosystem because everyone here will know that what the major tech companies are doing is not is building from areas of existing market power to take adjacent services and markets and to then interrelate those services so that there are either binding exclusivity you open uh, an android powered device and you will have as default already preloaded uh, Google search capacity um, facility. So they are, are sitting in their binding together of services, one with the other. What we were wanting to do was look at new areas of services and new areas where this is occurring, including cloud services, um, where many people may be aware in terms of our own personal devices, the ACCC is seeing as an agency, we are all paying much more for these services. Um, and it's reasonably opaque who's offering them and how they're being offered and what the charging base is and how it links into the, uh, into the ecosystem. So it, it, it is causing impacts across the economy because of the requirement to use these services and the ubiquity of the services. The, um, uh, apps and co computer software services that all of us need for business and daily lives. So we wanted to much more in much greater depth investigate and make more transparent what we think is currently quite opaque in the way the ecosystems are building market power and exercising market power. Thank you. Uh, next question from Adrian Rollins. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my question, uh, which is um, the Australian competition law specifically carves out uh, employment conditions and so on. Um, but uh, it, evidence would suggest that workers are suffering from the effects of a lack of competition in, in the areas, um, things like uh, no, no poach agreements and so on. Um, is this an area that the ACCC should be looking at and moving into? Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right that the Act, since its inception in 1975, carved out uh, terms relating to employment conditions. And I have actually been trying to go back and look at explanatory memoranda and to properly understand the thinking at the time. I think it was because there's such a strong face in the industrial relations system and that that was the proper place uh, for these matters to be determined. Um, <clears throat> remembering that it, it was a Labor government, the Trade Practices Act was one of, of the very important innovations in law change that were brought uh, by the Labor government, in, including it, that was worked on in 74 and 75. We now have a question, and Minister Lee is very concerned about it, as everyone would know from speeches that he has given, that uh, it is possible that the industrial relations system and uh, unlawful restraint of trade laws at a state level are not doing the work that they should do. That uh, um, data and evidence analysis needs to be done to assess how broadly anti-no-poach uh, clauses are and how deeply throughout the workforce they are employed. A and as we understand, Minister Lee has asked Treasury to do a data analysis about that. Um, if it were to be the case that uh, this is affecting uh, not just on an individual sort of senior professional 
people contracts where they are able to negotiate it, but it affecting the workforce broadly, we would see that this would need to be looked at from a policy point of view, but that and a reconsideration of what was quite a deliberate structure legally. But we're waiting to see what the evidence tells us. Thanks. Um, you can't come to the press club and not get a question about the news bargaining code. <laughs> um, a bit of self-interest. Um, we, we, we obviously, um, those, some of those agreements are starting to come up to the expiration date between the, the media publishers and, 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 and tech companies like Google and, and Meta. Um, there's been some concern raised that those companies may not sign, renew their agreements um, with, with the publishers. Are you seeing any signs of that? And, and are there any sort of changes that um, should be made to the regime that you'd like to see? The ACCC does not have a continuing monitoring role um, in relation to the code, uh, though we have uh, been pleased to see the agreements that were entered into, uh, as we understand it, 20 in the case of Google and 14 in the case of Meta. Um, the ACCC has also authorised smaller media organisations, including the country press members to be able to collectively bargain and they were able to enter into agreements. Treasury has recently concluded a review in relation to the operation of the code. It certainly endorses the importance of continuation. It recommends, and we welcome this recommendation, that the ACCC should be directed by government to assess the prevalence of the use of Australian uh, news media on the platforms, so relevant to looking forward and also whether there continues to be a bargaining imbalance between Australian news and the platforms. And if those recommendations are taken up, we're yet to see. The, the ACCC will then have a focus on monitoring the questions that you're raising. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, next question from Nick Stewart. A Canberra Times question again. Um, uh, basically, if you want a mortgage here, you've got NAB, Westpac, other competition. You know, there's it, it's it's the same, basically, money will cost you the same to buy a house here as anywhere in Australia. On the other hand, if you want to take an aeroplane uh, when, you, when you flew in here today, you were playing a capital premium. Is there anything that you can do or that we can do to actually challenge that, to, to make it not uh, a gouging exercise <laughs> by particular airlines? And you mentioned uh, one, Qantas, I think you said, has, is the most complained about airline, which is an, an Australian thing. Um, uh, is there some way that we can introduce competition to that market that isn't otherwise available because there's there's not the capacity. So firstly, I, I think that comment in relation to most complaint came from a question. However, I will uh, just um, uh, now look specifically to your question, Nick. So the ACCC has focus on a number of aspects that are necessary to free up greater competition. So one critical one is the slots at Sydney Airport, actually, um, because it functions as such an important part in the whole East Coast network, in essence. And uh, we are hoping that the review that is underway in relation to the uh, granting and particularly the use it or lose it aspects of slots at Sydney Airport will open up the capacity for new entrants and for the expansion of new entrants. Uh, the other aspect that uh, we have been considering uh, the question of uh, exclusivity agreements that are entered into at certain airports in, in terms of services between uh, incumbent airlines. So we have some powers, but the critical capacity questions sit with the regulation of the slots. Thank you. And our, our final question for the day, um, Maurice Riley. I was going to ask this question for Tim Shaw, but his question has just been asked, so I'll, I'll just put a back up here. Uh, I've been reading, uh, been following in the Australian the uh, 
toll Global Express and the Australia Post uh, uh, gunboat uh, diplomacy that's been going on. Um, and I'm just wondering whether the ACCC is looking at any of the competition issues at Australia Post, noting that there is uh, an inquiry, I suppose, a modernisation inquiry, uh, or the calling for submissions at the moment. So I wonder whether those issues of one being a monopoly business and uh, another business being a competitor. The, so those questions have been raised with us. The, and the questions relate to the combination of both a monopoly business alongside a community service obligation in terms of the delivery of standard mail, um, a parcel delivery service uh, that is competitively constrained and particularly significant in rural, regional and remote areas. So we do see uh, quite a complex intersection between policy questions, government ownership questions, and uh, service, particularly in remote and regional communities. We are considering whether there are competition questions here, but we recognise it sits in a broader government review policy context. Thank you. And uh, Gina Cass Gottlieb, thank you very much for your speech and presentation today. Please accept our gift of membership to the club and please everyone join me in thanking Gina.